Welcome to today's American Security Project webinar. This is an on-the-record conversation that will be available for attribution. A recording of this conversation will be posted on our website. All audience members will be muted during the discussion, but please use the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions to the panelists. With that, Matthew, over to you. Thank you, Courtney, and uh, thank you everyone for joining us this morning for our ASP webinar. I realize it's also not morning anymore. We're now in the afternoon. Um, I'd like to welcome our guest speaker here today, uh, the Honorable Patrick J. Murphy. Uh, Patrick Murphy was the former Acting Secretary of the United States Army, the 32nd Undersecretary of the U.S. Army, a House Representative from Pennsylvania's 8th Congressional District, and the first veteran of the Iraq War to be elected to that position. During his time in Congress, Murphy served on the House Armed Services Committee, the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, and the Appropriations Committee. He is now a senior managing director at Ankara, a top management consulting company, and wears a variety of other hats in entrepreneurism, film, and academia as well. Under Secretary Murphy, thank you for joining us. Matthew, thank you so much, and Courtney, for organizing it. It's great to be with everybody. Uh, I'm just excited to be here and really excited to talk about such an important topic. Great. So let's just jump right into it. I know you had a few things you wanted to mention before we uh, get started and jump into our questions. Uh, as uh, I mentioned earlier, we will have some time for audience Q&A that I will try to weave into the conversation. So please feel free to submit your questions via the Q&A box. But otherwise, the uh, floor is yours. All right. Matthew, thanks so much. And listen, I appreciate it. I am here uh, in New York City right now in Fox Studios. In case you're wondering, I'm in one of the telephone rooms. I just left the, the main studio. We just did a hit actually on uh, Fox Business, Sparney and Company, uh, literally talking about China and AI. And it's critically important when we look at international security. Um, and just appreciate, uh, obviously, uh, ASP, the American Security Project, for hosting this event and talking about such an important topic uh, that not just relates to national security, but the future of America and this world. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, if you saw my foxnews.com article that we pushed out, and, and if not, we'll probably, probably try and put it in the chat box, or my hit that I just did, you know, we are in a great power competition with China. Uh, make no mistake about it. They are a strategic competitor. Uh, if you read Bloomberg News today, uh, the analysts will say that we have about a three-year head start on uh, AI over China, but they plan on basically being our peer competitor within three years and, and, suppress and surpass us by 2030. Uh, I put that on my social media at Patrick Murphy PA. But the reality of it is, is that we have two different approaches. Their approach is fundamentally you know, the, the communist, the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP, uh, the socialist um, uh, governments that they have, and that they have a truly a whole of nation approach um, versus a whole of government approach uh, that we often see ourselves here in, in America. And that whole nation approach, to be clear, is really that the government uh, mandates that industry in China follows the rules and do what they tell them to do. Uh, it is not uh, traditional like we have here. We have a separation between the private and public sectors, although we need to do more public-private partnerships. Uh, they, when you do business in China, it is ruled by their government, period, uh, full stop. So we need to understand uh, that obviously with what we see right now what's going on with their aggression, and again, it's the aggression from the CCP. It's not the aggression from the 1.2, 1 1.3 billion Chinese people. It is the regime of the CCP that's doing the aggressive measures that they have. And, and I don't think probably this audience needs to know. Uh, it's pretty clear uh, that China has disregarded international norms, that they've been very aggressive uh, toward the United States of America and other countries. Um, and I'm not just talking about the spy planes, the spy balloons uh, over the United States. I'm not talking just to talk about the secret police stations across the United States. The fact that um, they have a, frankly, a Trojan horse when it comes to TikTok getting our young Americans data, uh, or the fact that they have hackers that are every day trying to hit our government and private companies, uh, and that they don't share our values. I, I think it's pretty clear when they have over 1 million 
Muslims in concentration camp uh, in in China, uh, and America has been, you know, really um, a leader in the world. Uh, we believe in religious freedom and liberty. Um, I know after 9-11, my first deployment uh, under General Petraeus and our then Colonel Mark Milley who was a ground forces commander who is now the chairman of the Chief of Staff. You know, we went into Bosnia and Kosovo. Uh, why? Because they were killing Muslims on the side of the road in villages like Srebrenica and elsewhere. And it didn't end until the United States of America went on board and, and ended it. Uh, as the great Colin Powell once said, the United States is not the policeman in the, of the world, uh, but when other countries call 911, we answer. Um, and so when you look at that, we are a great power competition, when you look at it, they don't share our values. And then you look at the strategic technology uh, that some big American tech companies are developing in China. You know, these are strategic assets. These are, when we're talking about things like generative AI, these are things that touch directly our national security. And if that generative AI and these strategic assets with American tech companies are developing in China, get into the wrong hands, get into the hands of CCP, which they are known for going in and being heavy handed and just grabbing it from private companies in China, that will be a direct threat of American national security. That will be a direct threat against the world if it goes into the wrong hands. So, you know, when we talk about it, and we can talk further about it, but when we talk about things like, you know, I laid out in the article, uh, you know, when we talk about, what do we talk about when gender, you know, AI, we're talking about computer vision, natural language uh, processing. When you talk about facial recognition, uh, facial recognition uh, in the wrong hands um, and that generative AI uh, will do uh, our families and our national security harm. So we have to be smart about it. Uh, we have to be direct about it. And let me just, just pause and just say one thing. As someone who's, someone who's been on two combat deployments, America is at her best when we are the reluctant warrior. I am not saying let's get into a fight right now with China. Um, I want to make sure that we do everything possible to avoid a war. But let's be very clear. As General Patton once said, a gallon of sweat saves a pint of blood. And we have to train. We have to be ready. Train like we fight. We have to be ready in case we ever have to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a country that's three times our size. But as I say that, we train like we fight, we train the next generation of American warriors. So hopefully we do not have to fight because those of us who have solved combat are reluctant to enter in other ones. So our sons and daughters don't have to do what we did. So I just wanna be very clear about that, but we can't continue to have blinders on as a country when we have these strategic assets being developed in China by American media tech companies and look the other way, they have to pick a side and we have to do more. So I just wanted to, to you know, lay that out there. I know we have some questions uh, already in the chat box. I'm gonna turn it back over uh, to Matthew uh, for directions and Courtney, uh, but appreciate everyone tuning in. We have over hundred folks uh, and let's have the conversation. So Matthew, back over to you. So I wanna, I wanna touch on, on the AI issue it, itself and uh, particularly what is it about AI? You sort of touched on things like facial recognition, but what is it about AI itself that, that concerns you so much? Um, what is it about China having access to, because everybody's currently developing this, this technology. Um, I mean, are there particular industries beyond AI that, that concern you or are you really focused on, on that in particular? I'm really focused on generative AI, and, and that is because it is a direct threat to our national security. Uh, I'm not trying to say all business can't develop products in, in China and we shouldn't use it. I, I'm not saying we have to even decouple our whole economy against China, but we have to be smart about when we look at we should decouple our strategic assets that are being developed by American companies in China because they will be stolen. They're trying to steal our products, our IP, and intellectual property here in America. We can't turn a blind eye on what will happen uh, in their own country. When we talk about data centers, when we talk about research centers, we have to be smart about it. And American media, sorry, American tech companies, I'm here at an American media company, that's why I'm saying that. But American tech companies need to be smart uh, about what we're doing over there. And we have to, frankly, use 
the power of the purse of the government. I could talk about what we should do about it, but we have to be, you know, I mentioned when you say simply Matthew, the technology, when we talk about generative AI, I have a lot of heartburn when you talk about facial recognition, when you talk about computer vision, when you talk about natural language processing and what that could do when they talk about multimedia platforms and, and some of the things they could develop today using that um, is something that could really do harm, uh, not just the United States of America, but to our allies that do follow international norms, that don't disregard them, that do support democratic values like freedom of speech, freedom of religion, uh, and freedom of enterprise. So in your in your recent op-ed, and there should be a link to that in the in the chat, titled uh, "AI Companies Risk U.S. National Security by Working with China: Time to Choose Size," you specifically describe the current situation as our Normandy moment. Can you expand a little bit on what you mean by that and how that sort of compares to the situation we faced in June of 1944? You know, Matthew, I was blessed twenty over twenty years ago. Now I, I was on the fa faculty at West Point, uh, and so I loved history. And we better learn from history. Uh, and, you know, our Normandy moment, which again happened 79 years ago when we had paratroopers from the 101st Airborne Division, uh, you know, and jump in and Normandy Beach and D-Day, et cetera. Um, you know, the greatest generation uh, really, you know, came through for the world. Um, and they're called the greatest generation, Matthew, not just because of the battles we fought and, and taking over uh, Nazi Germany and, and you know, beating them uh, or the empire of Japan. Uh, it was really about coming back home afterwards and creating the number one economy in the world. That's why, you know, they were the greatest generation, you know, because they started companies like Comcast and Nike and Walmart and Enterprise Car Rental and Ralph Lauren. Uh, I can go on and on. Uh, that was that generation of warriors came back and started those small businesses that became global iconic brands. But we have to learn the fact that the world came together to stand up to Nazi Germany, which we all know the history of them killing Jews, et cetera. And um, we have to make sure that we learn that historical lesson. And what you're seeing with this aggression with China that is disregarding international norms, which is clearly hostile and taking actions against the United States of America, um, that is not good. Uh, and we can't just have our heads buried in the sand. I understand we're all working hard, but we have to work hard and we have to work smart. And, and learning from that Normandy moment to make sure that we prevent another world war, that we prevent uh, another massacre that happened back then from happening today or tomorrow or within this next decade. So we've got a question in the chat that's asking about uh, AI chips exports and, and whether that's helping. And that, that makes me want to ask about something that you you touched on in your, your op-ed. Because um, we've seen both the, the Biden and the Trump administrations have, have enacted several economic controls against China. I even saw today that there's, you know, a value of Chinese stocks are dropping because GPU producers are, are not going to be allowed to, to send as many GPUs or high-tech GPUs over to China. And in your op-ed, you wrote that um, basically a national AI strategy should include tools that leverage the power of federal procurement specifically, uh, especially through the Defense Department to incentivize investment at home, but to neutralize it in China and other countries and other competitors. So can you explain a little bit more about that, that idea and what you envision there as a, as a way to discourage working with China? Yeah, I mean, you just you, you see the fact that some of the missiles that, that even Russia is using in, uh, against Ukraine um, use American chips. So we have to be smart about this is tied, these chips are tied to national security and if they're going in the wrong hands, that is not good um, for not just America, but for our allies, which are getting the brunt uh, from the bullies in the world like Russia and what you're seeing. So I, I would say to you, Matthew, very clearly, one, we absolutely possibly have to have a national strategy. Uh, there was a national AI strategy um, a commission led by Eric Schmidt, the former chairman and CEO of Google. I was just with him uh, 10 days ago with uh, Congressman Mike Gallagher, who uh, has the oversight committee of the CCP. Uh, Congressman Gallagher and I are both uh, post 9 11 veterans. He served in the Marine Corps. I served on America's varsity team, the US Army. Uh, and, and we joke about that. But what we don't joke about is the fact that, you know, we both served on the 
uh, U.S. Cyberspace Solarium Commission. Uh, and so it was him and Eric Schmidt talking about these two commissions that did a phenomenal job. Uh, and I know we're going to turn to our Mark Montgomery in a little bit, but they did a phenomenal job at not just putting some report that's going to sit on a shelf someday, but having a report that called for action. Some of those actions are already implemented into law and to changes in the public sector, but also in the private sector. But when it comes to you know, that framework that they laid out in the commission to have a national AI strategy, we need to clearly develop one and implement it. And number two, you know, it has to be tied uh, to our DOD policies. Our Department of Defense is the largest federal agency, $800 billion a year in a budget. And if we have vendors like big American tech companies uh, that are not doing the right thing by the United States, um, you know, by doing things in China that they know in the long term is going to hurt us and hurt our security, we have to use that power of the purse of DOD. Uh, we need to make sure that we are very clear to them that if it's not a national security interest of America, that you can't sell Uncle Sam uh, and, and, and barter and, and come to an agreement with us for your technology products that we buy, at the same time doing things that do not help us uh, in China, period. And so we have to have a reckoning. And that's the decoupling that I call for when it comes to American technology and American tech companies to make sure that the technology that we develop with them or they did develop does not go in the wrong hands. Because if it gets into the hands of the CCP in China, it is not good for American interests and democracies across the globe. Well, you're, you're right when you mentioned um, that, you know, we've been finding components, American components, essentially, in, in a lot of the, the high-tech Russian weapons we've seen uh, in the Ukraine war. And not only the Russian weapons, but, the, you know, the Shahed drones that, that they've been purchasing from Iran are using American components. I mean, are you concerned that, that these companies are selling these components directly to them? Or are they bought on the open market? Um, or, you know, is there a way around these export controls that are allowing these countries to, to build these weapons? Considering that, I mean, is it too little too late? You know, if, if, a, if a war breaks out over the Taiwan Strait, um, China's got a significant arsenal. So, so do these export restrictions actually prevent anything in the short term? Uh, I think you're seeing some other restrictions happen and as positive. That, that are that are you know putting a squeeze on China and and they're complaining about it, uh, but clearly there's companies that are doing ends around and arounds and uh, and you see it frankly Matthew in the Ukraine I mean you see it where the whole world has really rallied around the legal uh, invasion uh, to stop Russia um, and what they did in Ukraine and what they're doing in the Ukraine, uh, but some countries uh, that are in Europe are still buying you know, Russian national gas. And that does not help uh, when your economic policy is not tied to your national security. Uh, and, and you can't stand up against Russia and, and call them out for that illegal invasion, that moral invasion, uh, or so many of the civilians are, are dying every day. Uh, at the same time, byproduct of a country that's funding uh, that illegal invasion that they're doing. So the lesson learned there is that when it comes to China, these American tech companies better be very clear. I get it. I'm a capitalist. I believe in the American economy, but I'm a compassionate capitalist. And I understand the fact that, you know, we learned in the 90s that it can't just be shareholder driven policies. It has to be stakeholder driven policies. What does that mean? Absolutely. Shareholders, you know, that have fiduciary interests and have an interest in the company have a seat, a big seat at the table, but the other stakeholders, such as the national security of democracies across the globe have to come into play. And they have to realize that that stakeholder policy and that stakeholder theory to this has to apply. We cannot, as a country, the United States of America, continue to look the other way when American tech companies aren't doing the right thing. Well, I mean, let's 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 look at that that argument and, and dissect it a little bit more because obviously companies do have an obligation to their shareholders, and companies that are working in China do create jobs at home. 
um, you know, the, these things contribute to the American economy and not in a small way. I mean, if we're talking about the Chinese economy, you know, roughly the same size as the U.S., it's uh, it's it's hard to deny companies that 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 interest, you know, especially when countries from around the world elsewhere will continue to invest in in China. So, I mean, do do these companies have an obligation to sort of uphold that national interest? Or does the U.S. government uh, have an obligation to uh, assist these companies in making sure that their bottom line is is protected if they're told to get out of the Chinese market? Yeah, and, and let's be clear. I mean, the, the largest growth of middle class customers are going to come from Asia. Uh, and I get it. But of the 1.2, 1.3 billion people in China, the average family is is making $12,000 a year. So it, it's not the same middle class family or middle class customers right now in China. Uh, and yes, they have a lot of techno technological um, uh, advances and an incredible economy uh, and other things, and a very strong military. And again, they are a competitor. They are, we are in a great power competition, but they depend on extremely low wages um, of their people. They cut off any type of dissent when it comes to freedom of speech, free, you know, freedom of religion. Uh, I already mentioned that they have over a million Muslims in concentration camps. Um, so knowing all those factors, yes, American tech companies, American companies, international companies have to be very leery that when you do business with China, and again, I'm not calling for complete, complete decoupling, but I am calling very clearly that we have to decouple are strategic assets. One of those incredibly important strategic assets is generative AI. And, and we got to wake up as a country. If they want to do business with the US government, they better uphold the standards with their other customers or not do business with them, especially if they come back and bite us in the ass and hurt American national security. I want to weave in a, a question from the audience, you know, and lo looking at this problem sort of holistically, um, you know, what is the number one initiative uh, that you'd put in place that would halt or at least slow down the sort of shrinking technological advantage over, over China as it catches up and could even prepare to, to surpass us? Well, first off, I think we have to have a very clear national security. Again, I, I, I want to have, you know, I, I want the fact that there is a decoupling and a difference between our public sector in America and a private sector. But we absolutely, positively, one, have to have a clear strategy against this great power competition of China. Number two, to execute on that strategy, we must have much more stronger public-private partnerships and some type of value set that we have the carrot and the stick. The stick I've kind of alluded to, the stick saying, hey, if you're selling to Uncle Sam, including the Department of Defense, you can't go and, and, and sell product or products that are going to hurt we're going to be developed in China that's going to come back and hurt Uncle Sam or the people that we pledge our lives to keep safe here at home. So we have to be very, very clear on that. But that carrot and the stick needs to come from a national strategy and has to be tied to the power of the purse uh, here in the United States. And I, you know, I talk about obviously Department of Defense, but the other federal agencies as well, it just happens that the largest one and the one with the biggest budget happens to be Department of Defense with an $800 billion budget a year. So speaking of, of the power of the purse, you know, reflecting on your on your time on the Hill um, and having served in as many committees as you've as you've served on, um, the, the Hill is full of rhetoric. And, and, and I'm wondering if there are, um, you know, some rhetoric that's either you think in this discussion, either too intense or not intense enough. I mean, with with so many people that are talking about competition with China right now, being that it's such a bipartisan area of agreement, um, are there areas you think are being sort of talked about too much or others that are not being talked about enough with regards to, to dealing with this situation? Yeah, Matthew, yeah, what I appreciate. Listen, I served in Congress for four years. It was like college. Right? I loved it. I loved my time. I had the opportunity to serve, as you mentioned, on the Armed Services Committee, the Intelligence Committee, and then as an appropriator on the Appropriations Committee. Um, so I, I love the fact that, you know, there's members of Congress that are literally moving the ball forward, that in America, it's so polarized right now. And you get the far left and the far right voices on whatever network, you know, bashing the other side. And, you know, these other nations, our adversaries, want us to divide, want America to be divi divided from within. 
Uh, and that's not a good look. And that's not that's not great for national security. And again, I'm, I believe in freedom of speech and, and all that, but let's be clear. I think the gotcha, who's tougher on this or that, uh, and the polarization is way too much. And we have to make sure that we're Americans first. So that's what I try to bring. You know, when I go on national television, that's what I try and do in my daily life. Uh, and I think that's what most Americans, they're tired, uh, tired of the politics. They're tired of just the rhetoric. They are very happy with things like bipartisan CHIPS Act. They're very happy with the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act. They're very happy when we have a debt ceiling compromise. Um, they're happy when we pass the National Defense Authorization Act every year. That's positive. We need to continue that um, and stop the polarization. I would say though, and very clearly, that I would say that we need to make sure more of what I wanna see from Congress is an absolute focus, like a bulldog on a bone when it comes to great power competition on the CCP. The China Communist Party is trying to do us harm. They don't necessarily care about the 1.2 billion people that they represent. Uh, they care about power. They care about taking advantage of their own people and they want to make sure that they don't wanna enter into agreements with other countries or the United States that is a win-win relationship. They wanna be the sole winner, the dominant force, not just in Asia, but throughout the world. Uh, and I worry what that would look like to the people, not just in our country, but the other countries that don't have the American military power. Well, let, let's go back to, to some of the issues that you discussed uh, earlier with what China has been doing and, and a little bit about what you just touched on right now, and that is sort of Chinese hard power, but particularly how they're how they're exercising it in the intelligence sphere. Um, and given that you were on the Committee on Intelligence, um, I'm sure you're constantly thinking about Chinese spy and espionage activities. So, you know, in recent years, we've seen quite a bit of, of heightened CCP intelligence sur surveillance you know, near the U.S., near its territories. Um, including sensor nets near Guam, the recent spy balloon, um, the police and the intelligence activity that was uncovered in New York. Um, I mean, I've I've attended briefings where people have discussed these fake Chinese police stations. Um, but as we're trying to curb the flow of critical technology, how do we actually prevent Beijing from using its existing surveillance technology, um, doing things like stealing our intellectual property, or you know just reverse engineering what it can get its hands on and using that to produce their own versions. Well, as a, as a great President Ronald Reagan once said, trust but verify. Uh, and when, when you look at the China rhetoric does not meet their actions. When they have military outposts that they're building, when they have diplomatic efforts that they're trying to do, it has been very transactional. Let's take an example of uh, the greatest population growth in the world happens to be happening in the continent of Africa. Uh, and those countries in Africa, uh, China has invested in the Belt and Road Initiative. That has turned out to be a very transactional relationship. Uh, and the African people in the different countries uh, are not happy with the relationship with China because they are not trying to make it win-win. Um, so I think you're seeing that it's not a genuine relationship like we try to have with our allies overseas uh, and make it win-win. Uh, we try to make it win-win and they do not. So I would say number that's number one. Number two is that uh, I, I think, um, and what I see, and as you know, I still you know maintain a uh, top secret SCI clearance. Uh, what I'm seeing is, is that China has been very aggressive in building uh, military outposts in places like Djibouti, Africa, and elsewhere, um, obviously the Cuba, uh, until that just came out uh, on the on the satellite base there, uh, doing surveillance uh, against uh, the United States, ninety miles away. Uh, these are aggressive acts. Uh, it, it's not coming out to the you know Cuban Missile Crisis level uh, that we see, where you know the Russians had missiles you know aimed at the United States. Uh, but what you're seeing uh, is that they have been much more aggressive against the United States, and as you mentioned, and as I mentioned in my opening, with the spy balloon, with the Trojan horse of TikTok getting our young people's data, when it comes to the secret spy stations, police stations across the United States of America, when you talk, talk about the incredible um, espionage of the cyber crime that they're doing uh, against American companies uh, and against our government, 
uh, it is not good uh, and we better wake up. Uh, we are now uh, in the fifth domain. It used to be air, sea, land, then it was space, and now it is cyber. Those five domains are critically important. Uh, and I know, you know we have some great guests that are here. We have Admiral Mark Montgomery, who's the executive director of the US Cyberspace Slam Commission. He's doing phenomenal work. Uh, we have Corey Simpson, who's a senior advisor there, Tatiana Bolton, who's now Google, who, who was on the commission with us. Uh, but when you see these great Americans who, you know, who are joining us here today, and again, the, the Secretary of the Army's, you know, cyber director, who's, who's one of the other guests that are with us today. When you see these great Americans coming forward to have this conversation, they understand that we just can't, you know, be an ostrich and put our head in the sand. We have to be, we have to one, wake up as a country. We have to understand that our strategy is critically important and we have to get after it. We have to plan our work and work our plan and have a strategy with the logistics and other mechanisms after that come to fruition is critically important, especially today, acting with a sense of urgency. We cannot continue to kick the can down the road. And I encourage anybody who's in the audience, uh, again, if you have uh, particular questions you wanna ask, please submit them via the Q&A box. Um, I wanna to touch on another thing you, you had brought up there a, a moment ago, and that is sort of how the US works with its allies. And the, the strength of, of America's uh, allies and partnerships is routinely touted across the, the world of, of, of international relations and how we deal with uh, our challenges and deal with our adversaries. So our strength uh, is partly uh, enabled by our relationships with other countries. So when we think about um, uniting the international community on, on a way to deal with China and its uh, uh, whether that's on the tech side, whether that's uh, dealing with Taiwan, how do we better align the international community against the uh, the dangers that China that China poses? Um, you know, when so many countries have a direct economic interest in partnering with China, um, whether that's on the national level or on a, a private economic level, um, you know, how do we deal with those that don't necessarily see the direct threat themselves and, 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 and aren't particularly threatened individually by China? Um, what would you say to, say, like a, a European or a Middle Eastern country that sees the benefits in trade but doesn't necessarily have a strong interest in the South China Sea? Um, how do we keep them on our perspective? We have to make sure that they understand this is a relationship, it's not a transaction. And we have to be very clear on why this strategy, and they have to adhere to this strategy and be our partners. And we are good partners to people. We're not trying to take their, their land, we're not trying to take their oil, we're not trying to take their, their treasure. We're trying to do what's right so people can live in freedom and liberty throughout the world. So, and I think part of this, and this is why Matthew, you know, I agreed to do this with you here today. I am all about educating, not just the American people, but people overseas the importance of having the proper strategy, the importance of having accountability, the importance of saying trust, but verify. And when we say education, it's not just like this, you know, critical, you know, thinking, it, it's like walking people through and, and walking them through and saying very clearly, like things like generative AI, it's a type of artificial intelligence, you know, that it's capable of generating text Im images and other media and, and basically responds to prompts and, you know, when you say, okay, well, uh, how's that going to affect warfare? Well, you know, when you do that, that, that is, you know, when you talk about corporate espionage, when you talk about, you know, things that could do us harm, generative AI involves, you know, it, that those modals, you know, they learn patterns and the structure of their input and the training takeaways, the training data, and, and then they generate new data. And, and they generate new data that has similar characteristics that could be fake and are fake that, frankly, will help basically divide us in the United States from within, uh, divide people from, you know, utilizing certain companies, uh, products, uh, and our allies. A and so if we don't have the proper strategy from the jump, if we don't make sure that we're doing everything possible to be proactive on the front end, we're going to suffer the consequences. And we've seen the consequences already with China, with their relationships, and in Africa with the Belt and Road Initiative, which has not been a good one for the people in Africa, uh, which has not been great for other countries that have entered into these transactional relations with China, uh, and they turn around and, and it's hurt their people, 
uh, and it's hurt their values. Um, and so I think we need to make sure that our national security, which is always coupled with our economic security, is clear uh, to our allies and our friends and how that could really come into play in the very near future. Uh, if we just look the other way with American tech companies, uh, willy nilly just doing business in China and unfortunately stealing that IP and stealing generative AI uh, for their practices with the CCP. Let's do a little bit of, of a compare and contrast sort of with the situation with, with Russia right now, where we've seen the international community come together um, to basically cut off a lot of a lot of the economic relations with, with Russia. And let's say that we're able to um, effectively cut off China from AI, um, from high tech components. I mean, do you think there is a risk that China will sort of follow the Russian strategy, insulate itself further and then focus more, perhaps, on R and D and building up its own sort of native ability uh, to to compete with the U.S. I mean, do we have a certain amount of leverage right now as it is, or is that outweighed by the risk? I think, Matthew, that's exactly my point, and what I was trying to say today is the fact that we have leverage right now, but we cannot let American tech companies to, to pour gasoline on the fire of what's going on in China. They are investing majorly in generative AI, let's be very clear. Uh, and so, you know, right now uh, in the United States, you know, we're ahead of the game on them, but barely. And, you know, we can't keep looking the other way if we have American tech companies that are partnering willy-nilly uh, in China, especially when you have the CCP, where, you know, they don't have a separation uh, of the private sector with their government. Their government mandates what goes on in that country. Their government seizes assets. Um, and I'm not just talking about, you know, American journalists over there uh, or, or other of our allies, journalists or, or people. Uh, I'm talking about, you know, our trade secrets, our intellectual property uh, and our generative AI capabilities. And so we got to wake up uh, as a country and we got to wake up as a nation that believes in freedom loving people, that believes in American values, that believes, frankly, not in American values, but democratic values, uh, freedom of commerce, freedom of enterprise, freedom of speech, freedom of religion. Uh, and you can't continue to look the other way with the human rights, human rights abuses that are going on in China, but also that they've already, to your first comment, they've already suppressed freedom of speech over there, that they're already trying to speak in one voice. Uh, and you don't wanna see um, that happen um, if they especially get ahead of the game when we talk about generative AI. So let's uh, let's say we, you know we're, we're we're successful in this. And it's a little bit of a of a, um, of a balance that we have to play, right? Um, you know, we can't be too aggressive. And you mentioned this earlier. We don't want to get into a fight with China. I don't think that's in anybody's anybody's interests. And I mean, that's part of deterrence, right? Is making sure that the other side sees it is not in their interest to start a fight. So one of the questions we have from the audience uh, asked specifically, what can we immediately do to send a loud signal to China that we're done playing their game, but simultaneously maintaining diplomacy and proper economic relationships? Um, you know, how do you... How do you convince the Chinese to stop what they're doing without it turning into a war? Well, first off, I mean, I think most Americans were, were tied to the, the attempts of mutiny and Russia with the Wagner Group. And you know, obviously that was big news, but the bigger news was the fact that Secretary of State Blinken, uh, Anthony Blinken was over there uh, having the conversations uh, that he had. The fact that we have Janet Yellen going over uh, in a couple couple of months, uh, that's those are positive steps, and then we have the Secretary of Commerce going over, you know, shortly afterwards. So all those things are good. We want to make sure that we keep up diplomatic channels. Uh, I think many of you know, many of you follow this closely. We don't have military channels open right now, but uh, our diplomacy uh, that is that's a positive thing. Uh, I always you know point to the fact that the symbol of the United States of America is the American Eagle. And the one talent has our 13 arrows signifying the 13 original colonies, but more importantly, our military might. The other talent has um, the, the olive tree, the olive branch, showing our diplomatic and economic might. Uh, and we have the number one military in the world, we have the number one economy in the world, and we use it as a force of good throughout the world and in our own country. So that's all positive. 
uh, but we can't continue to look the other way when we see the abuses. Uh, and again, not just internally to China, but there are abuses that they're doing where they're disregarding international norms. When we talk about the South China Sea, when we talk about some of the other things they're doing, uh, it, there's aggressive measures. And again, not just the spy balloons um, and the espionage uh, through cybercrime, cybersecurity violations. Uh, I think what we're seeing and what we need to do uh, is to wake our country up and to have a whole nation approach when it comes to the public sector, the private sector, to combat this great power competition of China and the China, the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, and if we look the other way and just bear head, bear head in the sand, it is not a good result for our families and for our children. There's a couple of questions in the chat uh, about India, and it makes me uh, think about sort of the, the BRICS uh, system that, that's being developed, the BRICS group. And, you know, that in their efforts to shore themselves up against, you know, uh, American technology, they might look towards India as, as a partner. And, you know, currently the U.S. is in a little bit of a tug of war over India because we want the Indians to be a sort of bulwark against the Chinese but the Indians are working with the Russians and the Chinese are working with the Russians and they all sort of are working on building this new economic system of competitiveness against the US. So I mean, is, is there a way that we can keep India in our sphere of influence, not let their IT sector benefit China? Is, is, is this a factor in your thinking? No doubt. And I think that it was great that we had uh, Modi here last week and we were off the red carpet that he met with our, our tech giants, uh, the CEOs of, of Apple, of Google, of Microsoft, uh, et cetera. And, and that was a positive thing uh, within the last, you know, the last week. Uh, I would say that uh, India for the most part shares our democratic values. Um, uh, they have more people than us. They're the largest democracy in the world, frankly. And, and so uh, all those things are, are positive. Uh, I, I would say though, uh, we need to make sure that uh, we trade and we do things with our allies and we have partnerships with our allies. Um, you know, the, the deal that we had uh, the, the build submarines and, and, uh, with our friends in Australia and the UK and other things are, are very, very positive, right? We're being smart about it. Um, you know, as a former college hockey player uh, and a men's league player now, you know, my, one of my favorite players ever was Wayne Gretzky. And he said, you know, I passed the puck where people were going to be not where they are now. And so <clears throat> we have to look at what partnerships, these public-private partnerships that we can have uh, with like-minded democracies throughout the world, such as specifically in India. And, and you're seeing that. You're seeing after the Modi visit last week that you're seeing um, semiconductor factories being built in India uh, and other technologies because you know we trust them. It's their democracy, they're not perfect. We're not perfect. Uh, but you know, as our constitution says, uh, in order to form a more perfect union. Uh, and we try to make our country, we have a great country because we're a good country and it's because we're working at it every single day to get better and better. And, and so, and we expect that frankly from our allies and, and we can't look the other way if there's other countries that aren't doing the right thing. Because uh, if they're not doing the right thing to their own people, they're sure as heck aren't gonna do the right thing by the American people or our allies. So just to, as we're coming up on, on the tail end of our of our conversation here, to, to tie it all in a bow, and this sort of echoes one of the questions we have from the audience, you know, if you have specific recommendations to the Hill um, or a specific recommendation in order to deal with this, this AI, with this tech threat from China, what is it? What do, what do we ask the Hill to do? Well, this is, first off, I'm a big fan of, of the chairman uh, of the CCP, Oversight Committee, uh, Congressman Mike Gallagher, um, again, former Marine. Uh, he chaired our U.S., co-chaired our U.S. Cyberspace Slam Commission. Um, Admiral Mark Montgomery, Corey Simpson, Tatiana Bolton, we've all, you know, folks who are on this call right now, we've all worked, you know, hand in glove with him uh, for, for years now. Uh, and we were just with him and Eric Schmidt just, just a few weeks ago. Um, we need to make sure that Congress gets it. They can't just look at the 50 meter target in front of them about re-election. And, and again, I understand domestic policies are incredibly important, but our domestic policies and our economy has to be tied to our national security and our economic interest throughout the globe. Uh, we have to get better at it. And so I think you're seeing some very strong actions when we talk about the CHIPS Act, when we talk about uh, 
you know, leaning on our allies to do what we're doing and, and not letting our American chips that are manufactured or, or invented here go in the wrong hands because we've seen when they go in the wrong hands like they have in Russia, where it's come back and bit us in the ass or, or bit, frankly, our allies um, like what we're seeing uh, in Ukraine. And so I would love for, for Congress to be focused like a bull, like a bulldog on a bone. Uh, and, you know, I think we could use leverage to, the CCP Oversight Committee that Chairman Gallagher is doing and, and others to make sure that we are aligned uh, and really be a little bit more nimble uh, in creating these public-private partnerships. And I'm not just saying with big American tech companies, but smaller ones too. As, as someone I've invested tens of millions of dollars in 60 veteran companies, uh, and these are dual-use companies, uh, the value of debt is a real thing. Uh, and that's part of American capitalism. But we have to be smart that are that we have to, you know, really, you know, lean on the Department of Defense. We have to lean uh, on the best and the brightest in our country uh, to come together uh, to realize that we can't let this incredible technology like generative AI go into the wrong hands. We have to double down our investment uh, and we have to double down so it, it's going to protect not just our families, but our allies and democracies throughout the globe, because if it gets in the wrong hands, uh, it will not be good for any of us. Well, there's the focus of the bulldog on the bone, and there's a focus of my cat on his uh, food bowl. That's something else, let me tell you. I've never seen so much focus. Um, <laughs> but that's, that's all we've got time for today. Uh, thank you for, for your time that you've spent with us and our audience. Thank our audience for the time that they've spent to, uh, to listen in. Uh, if our audience is interested in this subject, we have launched a new section of our website on China and strategic competition. I encourage you to check it out. You'll find more to read on this subject and others. And we hope to see you at the next event. Until then, take care. Thanks, Matthew. Thanks, Corey. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for joining. A recording of the session will be posted on our website at americansecurityproject.org. Keep an eye out for further China strategic competition research and events by following us on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you.